Uh, this is Anthony Floyd, uh, Green Building Program Manager for the City of Scottsdale. Thank you, thank you for everyone attending. Uh, we've been doing our lecture series for 23 years. I was just thinking about that since uh, 1998. And uh, we just started earlier this year, uh, or last year, uh, doing webinars. All of our lectures were always in person. So this is still a new experience for us. We're doing our events every other month now. Our first kickoff was, as webinar kickoff was in December on energy efficiency and performance. And this is our second second one of the season. And we're happy to have Joan Barron back with us, who, who's been with us for a number of years, at least once a year, coming out to our lectures to talk about uh, gardening, edible landscapes, and, and community gardens. and. Today, Joan is joined by Morgan uh, Winburn, who uh, is also a master gardener, joining Joan. Uh, Joan is also an environmental mixed media artist and an environmental advocate. So she's been a strong proponent of green building and supporting the city of Scottsdale in our efforts. So uh, at this point, I'll introduce you, turn the program over to uh, Joan and Morgan. Take it away, guys. Hi, everyone. We are so excited to try this out for the first time um, on location instead of inside a building. Uh, and we just have a beautiful day out here. And uh, I'm really excited to, to try this out. Uh, there's, uh, as you can see in the background, there's some amazing plants and colors. And uh, we're going to start and talk with you a little bit about um, what we have right set up here for you. And then we're going to take a little tour through the garden so you can see different things growing and things uh, going to seed and what we recommend that you can do, how to recognize a plant when it's uh, uh, going to seed. Um, we'll do some demos for you, and um, uh, at the end, we're going to uh, have a chance for you guys to have uh, type questions in the um, chat, and we'll hopefully have time to answer them. And if we don't, um, we are planning to post the video talk um, today um, and eventually you'll you'll get a notice about where you can view it we're really excited that that will be an opportunity for everybody because we we know that some people really wanted to be here but couldn't make it at this time so we're thrilled about that and we'll also be able to address um, other questions at that time so um, I do want to acknowledge first and foremost, that we are on Native American land here and express our gratitude and thankfulness for this opportunity to be here. We thank the, um, the Peeposh people, we thank the Hohogum and um, others who, who made this land here available for us to continue to nurture. I want to introduce you to my new best friend, Morgan. And um, the reason I say that um, is because Morgan and I met here at Clark Park Community Gardens. And we are both master gardeners. However, even being a master gardener, the more we learn about growing food and uh, exploring the seasons here, the more we realize there is to learn. So it's very exciting here and we hope that many of you will venture out and come visit the Clark Park Community Garden. It's open to the public um, and you can go to both our uh, Facebook page and um, also the Tempe community. It's the TCAA garden. Right, it's called TCAA. 
and you can find that just by Googling it. And uh, you can volunteer here. We, we have all met each other by volunteering. And those uh, Joan, usually, uh, yes? excuse me, could you share your screen? Because we, we're not getting a larger, at least I'm not getting a larger video of you. Uh, Brian? No, no, Anthony, you have to change your view in, in the oh, upper okay. right hand corner. Okay. That, 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 that's on your end. Okay, great. Thank you. Yes, yeah, so if you're not seeing it, if you're seeing yourself, you need to be in um, a speaker view. Or if you're in gallery view, you'll see everybody. But if you want to see us, uh, it's better to be in speaker view on Zoom. Okay, so. thank you. Sure. So, yes, so we, we are both gardeners at home and we still enjoy coming to the gardens here because we meet other gardeners and we learn things every time we come. And the, we have raised garden beds here, whereas at our own homes, we may not have uh, raised beds. And so it's a whole different experience and opportunity to grow more varieties of things. And we also operate uh, what's called a CSA, which stands for Community supported agriculture and many of you know about that but many of you don't and what is so cool about a CSA is that we're able to support our local farmers there's a good 20 farms that we rotate around during any part of the year and um, the easiest way to find the CSA that operates out of Clark Park Gardens is to go to Sun Produce uh, CSA. And you can just Google that. Sun Produce CSA. Okay. Okay. So, yeah. And um, so I, um, it's such a beautiful afternoon here. We have a lot that we want to cover. So we're going to cover a lot, especially if you're new to gardening or have been gardening for a while. Um, I've been gardening in central Arizona. I've, been, I've gardened all over Arizona, but central Arizona um, for the last 15 years. Uh, and I started out with just a simple container garden. I took some five gallon buckets and that's where I got the bug. And now <laughs> and then I uh, kind of took over my own yard converted a pool yeah i converted a pool and um <laughs> i have like a food forest and little micro environments in my backyard and front yard and then when i outgrew that i came to the community gardens <laughs> i've been volunteering here at right. Clark park for about three years um i managed the production garden um when we had a farmer's market and then um now i manage i help facilitate both gardens here at Clark Park and also our sister garden, Escalante. So um, I started out with a five gallon bucket and learning um, as much as I could from other gardeners who've right. been doing it for years here and learning and adapting to having four different gardens. Right, and so, so the bottom line is we're really encouraging all of you to get involved in a community garden and experience. You meet new people, and more importantly, it's the one place we can all go during this crazy COVID experience we're all dealing with, right? You can be out here, and the only reason Morgan and I are really wearing masks is because we're just so close together during the presentation, we just want to be extra careful. But otherwise, you know, there, it's very easy to keep your distance here. Yeah. And, um, we right? still wear masks just to be safe in the garden when there's a lot of people. When obviously, there are a lot of people. But... Obviously, um, but it is outdoors. And so it is one of the places that we can actually congregate and have a sense of community in that. And one of the, the things, the greatest things about gardening is, is the, the oral history. There's a lot of that we learn from each other and talk to each other, what works, what doesn't work. Um, with the community garden, we get the opportunity to garden multiple different ways and experiment and, and learn from each other. 
as well and have that sense of community. Obviously, that's why the word community is in front of garden. <laughs> community comes first. Gardening is the wonderful byproduct of it. I'm going to show you a few books really quick because whenever I give these talks and I bring all these awesome books, I always run out of time. <laughs> so I'm just going to flash them really quick because they're fabulous reads. And um, the first one is called Bees by Rudolf Steiner. And it's lectures by Rudolf Steiner. And what, what's so, I don't know can, if you guys can see it with yeah, reflection or not, but um, what's so cool about, um, about this book is he approaches it from the whole spiritual connection to the natural world the rotation of the sun and the behavior of the queen bee and just takes you into a deep, wonderful dive into uh, building how we can better build a relationship with bees. And we're gonna talk more about that later because it's critical that we grow and plant food and flowers for the bees. The next one is um, Come Home to Eat. Many of you may know Gary Nobbin uh, he's an uh, Arab American uh, folklorist of regional foodways. He's an amazing, prolific writer. This is probably one of 30 books he's written. Um, and he lives in Patagonia. So he speaks about the, en the environment that we're all living in. So um, next is Wild Edible Plants of Arizona. And that's just chock full of, of over 50 wild edible plants that you can recognize, learn to recognize when you're out on hikes and go, oh, hey, I know what that is and bring it home and, you know, saute it and, uh, you know, have a delicious surprise for everybody. And then this one is one of my favorites. Oh, say, can you seed by none other than our cat in the hat. Um, from Random House. And it's just a fabulous little book to read to kids. So if you're a teacher or if you're, you know, you have little ones, it's a great introduction. And uh, a couple more little quick plugs. One is if you've never seen this magazine at Edible Phoenix, you must go find it. Most of the markets around the valley from Old Town Scottsdale Market to uh, the Roadrunner Park uh, Farmer's Market up in Carefree, you can go. You can find it uh, in Buckeye, Arizona, Sun City, Anthem. You can, you can also have it delivered to your home now. They yeah. do have a subscription service and it can be delivered directly to your home. And the thing that's so wonderful about it, it's got recipes and it's all written seasonally for us here in the Valley. Um, so, um, and then my last little favorite is uh, many of you have uh, heard of Michael Pollan. This little book is just delightful. It's uh, words of wisdom about how to gro grocery shop, which mainly he advocates as Morgan and I do, is get out to those farmer's markets and uh, avoid the grocery stores as much as you possibly can. Um, we're still caught up in this cycle of, you know, uh, a Western attitude about food. And um, it's not, uh, the majority of the food in the grocery store is not seasonally grown for us here in the desert, nor is it that healthy. It's full of uh, corn syrups and uh, additives in order for the uh, mega farms to be able to produce quantities. Um, so I think you're going to get a good hit with us today <laughs> of what we're talking about. Yeah, well, some of my favorites are actually um, a little bit more independent and are written by people who have gardened in this area for quite a while. So. Um, this is one of my favorites. I love herbs in my garden and use it as an understory for my food forest. Um, this is by the Arizona Herb Association and talks about the different herbs that we can have here in, um, in, the, uh, uh, in our desert area. 
I also love the Maricopa County Extension has um, done tons of research with the University, University of Arizona on what grows in our area. And if you're, if you're wondering why your tomato leaves are curling or they have rot on the bottom of them, they're gonna tell you, or you can look that up. Or if you have questions about your citrus and why maybe the bark is peeling or your citrus were not as flavorful this year, um, what uh, nutrients you can put into the soil, the Maricopa County Extension right. is right. a great right. valuable resource. Broadway. Yeah, they're on Broadway, but all of their resources are online right. and they're free and downloadable. Um, as well as planting calendars as well through them. Um, the other resource that I, I really um, like is Native Seed Search, right. um, where they've actually done the research of what's grown here natively, um, working with the indigenous people and then the oral storytelling on how to grow here before it was colonized. Um, so those are my top three. Yeah, and they're fabulous. The the other one that uh, we are partnering with now, we're very excited about this new partnership, is the Rocky Mountain Seed Alliance. And we'll be showing you our section of the gardens here where we are doing the heritage, heritage grain trials. And uh, we'll, we'll take a little walk over there. If you have interest in uh, uh, going to uh, a, a deeper level in your understanding and experiences with seeds, uh, they offer seed school and they're uh, developing online courses now and it's it's just fabulous i've done it um and uh oh the wind's picking up <laughs> <laughs> well those are so, some of those resources so we, we just wanted to make sure we covered some resources for you and um you know i'm just looking at this list here um, everything from maya's farm to um southwest mushroom there's a blue sky um there are enormous number of farms all over Arizona uh, that you can Google and learn what it is that they have to offer. That way you can order from them, you can focus more on eating what's in season and support our local farmers. Yep. They really, really need us to, to support them. So I think now we get to kind of the fun part. Yeah. We've gotten through all the resources and you'll find your own favorites. There's not one favorite and every gardener has their own. Um, those are just some of the starting points for us. Um, but yeah, we want to get to some of the fun of gardening and um, maybe some of the more offbeat things um, that you can do in the garden. Joe's going to show us now one of the resources that a lot of people use and they actually throw out. Yes. Uh, so we've got a bowl full of eggshells and um, we want to encourage all of you to, to save those eggshells if you're not doing it already and just crunch them up. You can, it's real easy to do that. Yeah. It's and fun for the whole family, a family <laughs> activity. And then one of the things too is that we often start with, we think that we need to plant first and that's actually the last step. It's building your soil. Um, when I went to put in my food forest, I took two years building the soil before I planted anything. Um, so you want to start out with a really good soil, whether you're container gardening, base fed, in ground. Um, you want to start building the soil. We have good soil. We, we have do. clay soil. We have lots of, uh, and that is awesome. You don't want to take the native soil out. It retains right. water really, really well. And this by adding- It gets a bad rap. <laughs> it gets but, a bad rap. <laughs> but you got to blend, you got to blend uh, your, like uh, we have uh, Kellogg, which is a local organic soil that we're going to yeah. use to show you a, a cool little thing you can do with uh, with eggshells as well. We'll do that. But you just take- Yeah, you, 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 you want to, you just want to take some, you know, add this into your soil um you want to amend your soil with like i said kellogg is is local and you can find that in your local nursery or even the big box stores 
Um, or you can actually go to the distributor the, yourselves. Uh, they're located at 27th Avenue in Buckeye. Um, you can get it by the truckload there. But you want to mix that in with our native soil along with, you know, your organic material like um, your eggshells. Um, and you start composting as well. Uh, all of that is really great for your soil. And that's what you want to start building first is your soil. Another thing you can do with your eggshell is you, when you crack it to fix your breakfast, you crack it so that you're only uh, peeling. I hope everyone can see that. Um, you're just cracking the little top part of it. Um, and that way you can. I'm putting a little drainage. Yeah, there's one. Um, and you just want to um, take the uh, little water and you want to just clean out the little slimy stuff layer that's in there. Okay. And then Morgan's going to show you a really cool thing about how you can start your seeds. So she's going to take um, uh, the organic okay. soil. Yeah. So as you can see, this one is, um, it's got some wood in it. So seed starting, you want it to be as fine as possible. There is um, finer, but this is one that we often use in the garden. It's got a lot of organic material um, in it and the, um, the, the little sticks basically, they kind of wick the water as well. So you want to start with a good soil. Uh, Morgan, Joan. Yes. Uh, there's a couple of questions related to the soil and the eggshells uh, that would be appropriate right now. The first one is, have you ever used fish to help build the soil or feed the plants? Uh, we yes. use a fish emulsion. Well, actually, I, use, I, I, actually, I actually use fish in my garden. Um, I have a pond and I use the, the I pump out the water um, and put that directly into my garden. Um, and you're making your own. I'm making my right. own, but fish emulsion is a really great um, additive um, to put new nitrogen into the soil. So yeah. And the second question is, what is the name of the soil uh, soil source? Hard to hear exactly with mass. Oh, on. Kellogg. Kellogg is what the, the name brand um, at the store. It comes in the it's uh, it's got stripes. It's a big uh, three cubic bag and it's called Kellogg. Um, it's, it'll also say the business name is Omni uh, on there, but I believe the local name is um, uh, Grow Well. Oh, Grow Well, that's, that's it. That's it, the yeah. name of it uh, here. There are also other places like Sing Farm where you can get mulch. Um, the now they, they are more on the mulchy side. Yeah. They tend to be more like like this. Whoa. <laughs> yeah, like, this is real. This tends to be a little bit coarser, like this. Um, so that's not really good for planting seedlings, but great for your garden. Protecting on top. Yeah, Protecting and adding into the top. native soil. Um, and then also the city of Tempe uh, has opened their composting to um, the entire, they used to be just for the city of Tempe, but they've opened it to any residents in the valley. And you can get mulch, which is called their number two, and their number one, which is much finer. Um, and they have you can contact the city of Tempe as well through that. Okay, um, and and finally, why not just put the eggshells in your compost pile? You can. You can sure. That was the when we were crushing it up earlier. Yeah, okay. That's definitely good for your compost. Absolutely. This is just a fun way, especially with kids, um, and using an organic. Uh, it, it, instead of doing a peat. Um, pot, which is actually bad for the environment. Right. Don't go buying those little peat moss uh, pots that look tempting in the store. Yeah. Because they they retain too much of the water and it never gets to the plant, and then it dries out, and you killed your plant. And it's not it's not a sustainable. Um, it's not. It's right. not a sustainable um, material. So, being a little bit creative, using what you already have, like the shells. And then we're um, going to put a seed. Or, yeah, like the, or your yogurt cups. So they don't end up in yogurt the, cups. They don't end up in the landfill. Um, those are different ways of being a little bit outside the box and um, using what you have on hand. Gardening can be, get very expensive. It can be an expensive hobby or you can get creative and it's not as expensive. So we're going to 
Gonna... But it will, the eggshells will take about two years to completely dissolve in your garden. So it's not a, a quick fix. It's one that you're investing time in. So because it's uh, beet, beet uh, planting time. Yep. We're gonna, Morgan's gonna take a few of these. Oops, a, a few. I never put more than three seeds in there. Um, just because they will start crowding each other out, and then you'll have to uh, uh, you'll have to thin out your seedlings. So I never put more than three. If it's a really large seed, like a like a squash um, seed, I would only put one in. But three is a good average. At least one of them, you know, is going to pop up. Right. And then if you need to, and it's too crowded. Don't pull it out. Just cut. Just snip it at the base of the of the um, soil line, and leave the roots in there. It'll add nutrients into it, uh, and it won't disturb the newly found roots that are. Going and and that's that's a really important tip, Morgan. You know that uh, so many of us um, in our early uh, learning curve and as gardeners, we think that something is completely worthless after the plant dries up. Um, and we don't see any more fruit uh, growing or flowers, and we pull the yank the whole thing out of the ground. Well, you don't want to do that. You want to leave the root in the ground. Just snip it down to the level of your your ground, and you're leaving nutrients in in your soil. And you're also making your soil. Um, you're you're creating a, a, an interwebbing of the soil, becoming more stable that way as well. So there's a few more wonderful things that we've discovered in our years of uh, experimenting in the garden with amendments to the soil. Um, one of my favorites is this uh, mushroom compost. Yes, and this is available at your nursery. Yeah, you can actually get this one at Lowe's, which I was so amazed. Um, so um, mushroom compost helps improve your soil structure and then also um, you know, it it has the name mushroom compost because it's so good for growing mushrooms because of its uh, mushrooms are loose, in, yeah, and mushrooms are an structure. integral part of the gardening. We think, oh my goodness, there's mushrooms. I've done something wrong. Um, actually, that's a really good sign that you have really great um, good bacteria right. in your garden. Worms so, love this yeah. stuff. So most most mushrooms are not toxic. There might be some that if you did eat them, they would unsettle your stomach, but most wild mushrooms are not toxic. There's very few that are actually horrible. The next one is worm castings. I know many of you have heard about it. Very, very helpful in uh, as an amendment in your garden. This, I uh, wish you guys could be here with us. It's to, black to, gold. Yeah, it's called black gold and it's very, very fine. And um, it's an organic fertilizer yeah. and it has nitrogen, calcium, and you can make a tea out of it, not for yourself to drink, but for your plants to drink. <laughs> you do one part of the um, worm casting and three parts water and you let it set for a few days. And then you have this fabulous um, uh, liquid uh, amendment for your garden. Yeah, it's really healthy for your garden. And the, uh, one of the ways to get that is at your local hydroponics store. Uh, they'll have uh, resources to that as well. Um, and they're also the worm farm uh, here in oh, Phoenix. Yeah, the, um, the worm farm in Phoenix. So yeah. What is it, 30th? Uh, yeah, it's up again south up. Up again, yeah. It's a fabulous place, place to go visit. Um, another um, um, uh, ingredient that we love is called uh, bioflora, or fondly known as dry crumbles. And these dry crumbles are rich in potash, nitrogen, and phosphate. And um, you just, they're chunkier. So it's easy yeah, to yeah. just kind of cast cast out into the garden. And they're a slow release. So this is a slow release. Like your fish emulsion will be, be a fast release. Um, any of your manures, uh, like your cold manures, like chicken or rabbit will be a fast release. 
these are a slow release in your garden so you can have multiple levels of that as well and we have two more to share you don't have to use all of these but we want you to know that there are all these options and they're each one offers a, a, a real nice additive to the soil and uh, this one who, any of you that might have chickens um, this is an, a soil builder and it increases it helps increase the microbes in your soil which we want and it's chicken poop <laughs> <laughs> and you can get that at your local nursery as well they or, have it or go to go to your neighbor who has chickens and say hey can i have some of uh, some of the, your chicken poop i'll go sure because they know that it's really good for the the garden um the last one we want to share um, is azomite. Some of you, I, I'm going to guess, have heard about azomite. It also really helps to improve the, the roots, uh, root structure. Um, it's, it's actually volcanic ash deposits. So it's just rich in trace minerals. So obviously, really good for our plants. Yeah. Um, a, a, lot, a lot of people like to do a mix of five or six of these uh, ingredients that we just showed you, mix it up really good and put it in the hole before you plant your fruit tree. And that's gonna give it like- a, Or any of your transplants really. Yeah, true, any, any transplant. Um, but a lot of people forget to think about their fruit trees when they pick them up from either the urban farm or right. any, any number of nurseries that, that um, have uh, the low chill hour fruit trees. You always want to check on that, um, that are grown for our particular climate and conditions. And actually one of the greatest resources, all of these can get a little expensive. Um, but you, but you they know, also last a long time. They last a long time, much. definitely. But one of the biggest resources that you have is actually in your kitchen. Um, and those are your, your scraps, yeah. all of your scraps. Um, you can actually do a couple of different composting if you're not quite ready for the big composter. Um, I don't think either one of us would really recommend the tumble, tumble composters. They dry out too much for our area. Um, most gardeners will recommend a pit composter. So it's basically you throw it in a pit, you put greens and browns and you stack it. Um, so that's your, your other one. Um, that's what we do. Yeah. And uh, some people have asked us over the years, do you have any problem with flies or bugs? And we've never had any problem. We turn it, um, you know, weekly, yeah. just a couple digs with the shovel and flip it over and water. And just like Morgan said, you create a, like a lasagna mm -hmm. with newspaper, cardboard, then your yeah. uh, scrap foods and a couple other methods that I use is actually I bury a five gallon bucket with holes in it in my garden itself. And so when I do deep watering, I water that and then it disperses mm -hmm. the food directly into my garden. So you're making a tea. I'm making a compost yeah. tea within my own garden. Yeah, that's fabulous. And, and it does a great job of deep watering, getting down to the roots, getting into the soil. Um, and it's really kind of very no fuss. Um, the other thing that I've done with um, my, I, I've done this with the uh, uh, Girl Scouts that oh, yeah. I taught is you can actually make a very inexpensive worm composter. So this is kitty litter boxes. I like kitty litter boxes because I'm reusing something that would normally get thrown away. You can use the round ones, but what I love about this is if I get these drink carriers, I can put them directly into it and it adds another layer of um, compostable for my my work. So I put all my food in here. Um, you can actually put clean paper towels, cardboard, um, clean um, uh, papers, newspaper, uh, all of your kitchen scraps. Uh, worms are a little bit finicky, so there are some rules to that, but basically I have just take a bucket Drill some holes in the top for air so that the worms can breathe, and some holes at the bottom. So, 
some holes at the bottom so that the water can go through. And then I just put the stuff in there and stack it up as you go. There's a little bit more details and you can definitely get a DIY um, online, but this is one of the fastest and easiest ways to get um, another great project with family. Exactly, right? exactly. And you you can get your worms. They're called red wigglers from the worm farm or your local hydroponics store. Uh, if you don't have another friend that's willing to, to hand them off to you. <laughs> you can come get some from us anytime. Another fun way to plant if you're limited in space um, are these cool, um, uh, they're called root pouches. And um, they're kind of like, a, they're a felt material. And this one's like a three gallon size and you can plant right in here. Mm -hmm. And it, it's cool because it'll let the moisture stay in, but it doesn't- Allows for airflow within the roots so that yeah. they don't get anything. Yeah, it's, it's fabulous. We saw these here on Saturday mornings when we do the CSAs. So if you're interested in looking at one, um, you can um, come come see us. Um, we're actually going to be uh, um, there. Uh, we're going to be here at the garden Saturday morning. Um, so um, yeah, please come see us. Um, so the next thing I want to show you guys, um, I'm really excited, really, really excited about this. So a very uh, dear friend of mine, Carol Studert, she manages and teaches the Scottsdale Community College Community Gardens. And she got into propagating tomato plants. And the cool thing about this is that she has spent the last several years researching tomato plants that you don't see in the nurseries. And she has experimented with them and come up with, um, gosh, a good 20 plus tomato plants that do really well in Arizona weather. They love the heat, they love this climate, and uh, she spends uh, a lot of time planting first from seed and tiny, tiny little containers. Many of you have probably tried that. Then they get transferred to little, um, uh, little containers. And then eventually when they're big enough, uh, she transplants them into these singular containers. And um, come, we need to wait now till at least the 19th, I would say of February. March is um, better. And yeah, March is better because they're still pretty small. Um, but the cool thing is you guys can order these from Carol if you're interested in experimenting with some new varieties that you've never heard of, never seen. And um, um, she will, um, I, uh, I think what we'll do is post, yeah, we're running out of time. <laughs> um, she will, uh, we will post um, her email address. And um, actually I'd like to give it, you know, give you um, my, um, you can text me because um, I know some of you would love to get your hands on some of these like right away. So you can text me at 602-616-0223 and I will give you her direct email address and you can contact her and say you heard about the tomato plants on the webinar and she will uh, let you know what she has and uh, when you can come out to her beautiful garden in Fountain Hills and pick them up. So, so I stepped away for a minute. Did you go over a discussion the difference between transplants and seeds? Uh, no, I'm waiting for you to come back. <laughs> okay. All right. So yeah, so there's a difference than, than when you plant um, your transplants and your seeds. There are certain seeds that you definitely just want to transplant in the ground. Um, all of your root vegetables, carrots, um, beets, um, your greens, so the collards are, your, um, are usually better for planting directly in the ground. Um, those, are, those are really great. Your um, 
squashes as well uh, during the summer. It's just great just to plant those in the ground. They're hardy, they like right. it. They don't really like being disturbed. I've never understood when I saw transplant carrots at the nursery. Yeah, right, um, carrots love to go right in Right, that. and when you buy a packet of them, you get hundreds of seeds versus a couple plants. Um, and they're very tolerant and, and they have a quick germination rate. So those are really great to put into the ground. Now there are some other plants such as tomatoes, peppers, eggplants, um, your herbs and bushes that have a longer germination rate. So basically from the time you plant it to it starts sprouting. Um, and they're very finicky about- the pepper plant. Yeah, the little tiny pepper plant. They're very finicky more than anything the soil temperature is what causes them to kind of the seed knows when it's the right time to pop out. Um, and so the soil temperature is really, really key um, to making sure that the seed wants to germinate. Um, and that's why we have seasons. Um, with tomatoes, they have such a short growing season uh, where they like a certain temperature and then they give up. <laughs> Uh, they either stop producing pollen when it gets above 90 degrees, which means they're not going to fruit, um, or they right freeze. Here. Here's some peppers. Yeah. Um, so starting indoors for those types of plants gives them a head start for their peak growing season. Um, and so those are definitely recommend. We also recommend staying away from your big box stores on that and going to your local nurseries and talking to the nursery there because what happens is they're started here, they've acclimated to our environment, and they've also been hardened in ours. So when they're little like this, they're taken outside, given good sunlight, and then they're brought back in um, so that they can, you know, be, not be stressed out as much, but they're also acclimated to our environment. If you're going to a big box store, um, then what happens- You don't know where that soil is. Come from. It usually it's shipped from. in from right. usually California, so it's not really acclimated to our growing season, our environment. So we really recommend going to your small nursery. Um, Carol is awesome. People like Carol. Right? Yeah, Carol is or one. Velarde. Yep, my personal favorite is Velarde. I've been growing with her for over ten years, and I've never had an issue with her plants. So yep. we each have our own favorites. And as you get your own gardening community as well, you'll find that people will give you those. Um, plants and exchange them. You trade seeds, you trade transplants. It's just a beautiful... And you trade knowledge. That's yes. the greatest thing about it is when you get into a community of other gardeners is you exchange knowledge about where it planted, where it grew, what environment it did best in. Um, and so definitely we're going to always advocate local, 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 local. So definitely go to your local nurseries first. Right. Okay, Morgan, Joan. Oh, you have 12 yeah. minutes. Oh, jeez. And, <laughs> and, and I don't know if you want to allow for Q&A. Yeah, okay. well, we'll do our best. And uh, maybe we'll, we'll be uh, doing another one in March. Yeah. Who knows? So the three, the three things that you really need to take away is, one, build your soil. And that's why we spent so much time on that, is build your soil. Always, always build your soil. Then select the plants that are local for this area. Um, and see in season for that. And in season. So that's why we have Show seasons. The charts to you. That's yeah. Why those charts that we started out with are so helpful. And the other thing is too is because we're a lot of the big box stores uh, will go off of growing chart of the Midwest. Um, they are not in seasons and they're not acclimated to our environment. So look for local things that have uh, have adapted to our environment. You're not really going to do well with the giant giant beef steak tomato that you're going to get at, at the big box store, but do wonderful with uh, native seed search cucumbanias, which are a small cherry tomato that have acclimated to our environment. Okay, we can't leave today without talking about garlic, because uh, garlic is good for uh, maintaining our health, especially during the cold seasons. We love it in our soups, we love it in our sautéed dishes, but did you know that you could grow your own garlic from a garlic head, just like this? So Morgan's going to show you. You want to get the ones that have the roots on the bottom. Whoops. Like this. But you don't need them. They'll start sprouting on their own. And you just 
Oops, sorry. <laughs> you okay. just pull the clothes off like that. Yeah, you just pull them off like that. And then you see the, this is the bottom where the roots are gonna start growing from, not the pointy side. So I'm just gonna take this and I'm gonna go right over here to this beautiful soil. And uh, I'm gonna plant it. Just enough in the ground so that a little bit of it has room to move. And as you can see in the garden, there's a lot of things that are growing now. There's um, some cabbages. Yeah. There's some cabbages growing. There's a lot of collard greens growing. We have in the back, we have some loofahs um, and some Forage. other fish. forage. These are all our cold the weather. These are all our cold weather crops. Um, so they do really, really now. And that's one of the things that most gardeners is they try to grow things that are out of season and then they think they, they're a bad gardener. Um, the seed, if you plant the plants that are in season using the, the um, planting calendars um, are a great way to start or going to your community garden and seeing what they have going um, and what they're planting. Oh, Morgan, you gotta show them this. Okay. Check this out, you guys. <laughs> I asked Morgan I to bring her a <laughs> supply of hibiscus. So these plants actually- Oh, smells so good. These plants mm. are a Mediterranean um, plant. They're actually part of the, um, hibis the, the hibiscus, as is okra. So this summer, that's what I planted. I didn't try planting anything else. I planted these and my garden was over seven feet tall. The okras were seven feet tall. The, the, these just took over. They loved the Look life. Look at that. Look I didn't have that. to worry about them. So that's another example of growing in season um, with what what is adapted to that amount of sunlight, that amount of heat, and that amount of soil temperature. And like, grab that other jar real quick. Oh. This is an understory of um, uh, oregano that I have in my food forest. So it's in my ground cover. So I do take some, I use it directly in my food, cooking it fresh. Um, I dehydrate some of it. And then when it gets to be way too much, I turn it into a tincture. So this is basically um, oregano and vodka to pull out all the oils that are in it. And then I can use that as an antiseptic. Yep, so, it's fabulous. And um, another thing that you can do with garlic is you yeah. chop it up and you and you put it with uh, some ginger, a little apple cider vinegar, and a chiltepin pepper. Yeah. And so I'm we have a lot it. more. We have a lot more that we can show you, Joan. Well, actually, why don't you take them on a tour of the garden now okay. and show them the peppers and here's, the tomatoes? Here's what the chiltepin pepper looks like. It's just this teeny hot thing that just will kick your butt. Um, but that's the whole idea. When it's in a blend with the garlic, the ginger, and the apple cider vinegar, and you just uh, you sip it, it's an elixir, and it will really help you get over the flu bug. Yep. So I'm going to take you. Um, we have a few minutes left. Yeah, we're going to take you on a quick so tour. I'm send Go you over to this now. now. Sorry about that. Okay. All right. Here you go, Jack. All right. So we're gonna we're gonna head on over to the station over here that we set up. Wind kind of. And uh, just to let you know, Joan, there's about four or five questions. So F here. Hey Morgan, you wanna get it? So we're seeing over here along growing the vines is actually a loofah. Uh, it's a great for creating a, a vining. So this is an actual loofah, a, a gourd that is growing right here. Um, and so we are vertical growing this way with it. But what it is, as Joan has shown us here, is this is when it's dried out. And these are the wonderful black seeds um, that uh, any gardener who's grown them will happily hand them to you because they have lots and lots of seeds. Right. So we let it we let it go brown from what Morgan just showed you. It showed you it's green on the vine. 
we let it go through the season and look inside there. Isn't that the coolest thing ever? That's the fiber that makes the loofah sponge. Yes. We get asked all the time, uh, uh, I thought that came from the ocean. No, it's part of the cucumber family. And it's definitely one that you can grow in your backyard. Absolutely. They need lots of sunlight and they love the heat. They love the heat. Now check this out. Okay. So I've been soaking this and in, in the water. So right now it's hard when you harvest it, but all you do is put it in the water and check this out. Look how easy it is. It peels like a banana. And there's your sponge. Isn't that awesome? <laughs> You just let that dry out. Look at that beautiful thing. And they're pretty easy to grow. And there's some of the things that we wanted to show you real quick yep, um, is in, in the gardens is again, growing within season. We have here um, your Swiss greens, chard. your Swiss chards um, and various you greens. You wanna harvest from the bottom and work your way around the plant. I'm never taking more than two thirds of the plant, but you can definitely leave it there and continue to harvest off of it. Um, one of the other things too is a lot of the plant is edible. Um, so like these are beautiful, beautiful cabbages. And we only really see the cabbage head in the grocery store, but the rest of the plant is actually edible, such as the broccoli, um, the broccoli right here. Which the flowers it, are delicious. You can eat the broccoli, you can eat the leaves, you can eat the stock. So you're growing more than just the one fruit that we normally see. You can actually eat most of, of the plants that are growing. And let's go over to but uh, do we have any questions we yeah. need to answer? Yes. Uh, the first one is what was the name oh, of the last um, part? Anne asked place. about hibiscus. Yes, the rosella are the ones that are edible. Rosella. Uh, not all hibiscus are edible. Um, okra is actually in the hibiscus family as well. So rosella and, and okra are, are um, edible varieties. Um, you know that you can also eat nasturtium leaves. Everybody knows about the flower, but not that the leaves are edible. Oh, and I found out this year you could actually eat rosella leaves. Really? Yeah. Oh, that's cool. And it's all a, right. um, So yeah, definitely. Um, and and uh, if you chop up the um, the stalk of the broccoli, uh -huh. a lot of people throw that away, Morgan, right? They think yeah. that that's like, how can you eat that? Yeah. But if you chop that up really good, you can saute it. You can make a slaw. Yeah. So it's Anne amazing. asked a good question about what the raised beds are made out of. Oh, okay. These raised beds are actually a composite material of mostly recycled plastic. Um, they're made mostly from like the plastic for the um, container for um, milk and yogurts and made to look like wood, um, but they last a lot longer and we're also using recycled material. You can use wood, um, it will break down in a few every few years. Um, there's a lot of different structures that you can use to make the raised beds. And let's see, I'm looking through it. And um, this particular garden is Clark Park. A community garden located at Clark Park in Tempe, Arizona. It's on Roosevelt and Broadway is your your uh, east west street is yeah. Broadway. Roosevelt is next to Mill, so it's actually 1730 South Roosevelt. Um, and uh, please yeah. come see us. We are here on Saturday mornings. Um, and, and we do have a very small but lively market that is put together by our volunteers. Mm -hmm. And uh, we have two large volunteer boxes here that if you come and volunteer and work with us, then you'll be able to take whatever we're harvesting home with you. It's okay. a fabulous uh, relationship that we're building here yeah. with everyone. So, okay. And you can definitely see the different, different models of gardening that we have, we have in ground, we have raised beds, we actually have the ancient grain trials that we wanted. Yeah, you know, you we, can ran see. we ran out of time. We ran out of time. We have the new Lear Garden, which um, integrates fish and composting and soil and mushrooms right into the gardening itself. Um, so there's yeah. lots of ways to de definitely learn how to garden by visiting. Um, Absolutely. Yeah. Just and it's every Saturday. Come hang out with us. 8 a.m. to 11 um, is when we're in the garden. 
Um, so yeah, definitely. Any more questions? Am I? Um, then just for the contact, yes. Um, Jones, or uh, you can message Joan about yep. the um, transplants. Tomato. Mm -hmm, the tomatoes. Um, she also has pepper plants and some herbs. Yeah, and then uh, my favorite is Velarde. V i l a r d i. I'm dyslexic and I'm probably <laughs> Velarde. <laughs> Velarde, yeah. but if you you look up Velarde Gardens, and I can give it to you too when you uh, text me. Yeah. So yeah. Six zero two. Let's do that again. 602-616-0223. And that's for Joan. Okay. And it's five o'clock. All right. Yeah. Well, you guys, we got through a good chunk of what we wanted to talk about. Hope you had as much fun as we did. And uh, I hope to hear from you all. And uh, we're, we're looking forward to having it on the um, YouTube for you. Yes, uh, we'll get this posted. We'll have it on our Scottsdale Green Bye -bye, website. And uh, I'd like to <laughs> thank Joan and Morgan for a wonderful, enjoyable, enthusiastic uh, tour of the garden. And we'll have to certainly do this, do this again soon and allow them more time. So thank you, everyone. Uh, we'll be back. Uh, we post everything through our Scottsdale Green Building website, and we have a sign-up list for green building events if you'd like to be placed on the mailing list. So thanks again, and have a nice evening. Bye.